everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Wickedly Macabre. My name is Dee Seibel, and with me is my best friend, Tiffany Trigetto. Hello, welcome. It is currently 8.30 at night. Our time. Our time. Yeah, not your time, clearly, because you're not with us right now. The way that Wickedly Macabre works is every episode, we let... A coin flip decide whether or not we are going to tell a tale of true crime or a story that is based off a of paranormal and we welcome you to our first flip Tiffany do you want to be the f- the flipper of the coin today Can I be the thrower of the coin I mean as long I'm as it does flipping. rotations okay okay one two three five it is it is heads people we are doing true crime tonight Woo! The true crime story we have for you this evening. You are sensitive to um, sexual assault, violence against women, um, violence against children. Then I suggest wait, wait for our uh, next episode or the first paranormal episode and avoid, avoid this one. And that'll be your first go. The story we are going to tell you today is of Oregon's most prolific serial killer, Dayton Leroy Rogers. And I bet you have never heard of him. And the way that this case broke, and I haven't really talked to Tiffany about this either, the way that this case broke was so backwards. So backwards. And you will see what I mean as I start to tell the story because it is just, there's so many layers. It's early August 1987, right? It's about, it's real early or late in the mor- uh, yeah, no, it's like real early in the morning, like before dawn, it's like 3 a.m. We're sitting there, I don't know, having orange juice and a Grand Slam, you got your, your pimped out hair, I got a sweet mullet and some parachute pants. So basically what I was wearing it today. Yeah, exactly yeah. what you were wearing today. Same hair too, in fact. <laughs> so, sitting there eating our Grand Slam. All of a sudden, we realize there's a commotion outside. People are screaming. A woman, you can hear a woman screaming for her for her life. She's screaming, rape, help me. She's trying to get attention. And all this happens in just a matter of seconds. You have a crowd of people trying to get to this woman across the parking lot and they see a man come on top of her and say, everything's fine, we're good, and he disappears with her below the bushes. People are still walking over there, and by the time that they get there, they're able to see that this guy is in between this naked woman who has covered in blood and trying to assault her. Hold up. Yeah. Normally, when things like this happen people don't go help because it's the crowds someone else is gonna help so that's pretty interesting well this was also in the 80s that's true so you would have been like four and i was like a newborn and this was a completely different time than what we're used to where nowadays if somebody is being assaulted in public they just all pull out their phone this was in a time and in an area where people were really a community and they helped each other out i wish that was like this now i agree it would be a lot nicer of a place to live in so if um, you guys hear screaming go help yeah call 911 i mean call 9 call 911 um so they get over there. The guy runs off, and people are trying to help her. So two citizens, they notice that they that she's not breathing, so they administer CPR and life-saving tactics until the paramedics get there. But while they're doing this, the dude jumps back into his truck, a blue Nissan pickup, and takes off. Like, he drives over bushes wow. to get away from this crowd that is trying to stop him. So he takes off. And- Seconds later, another car pulls out and starts following him down. Yes, go get him! Down uh, one of our main thoroughfares here in Oregon, Glossom Boulevard. 
starts heading towards Oregon City and he is going on a high-speed chase. This isn't even a cop. This is a citizen, just a normal citizen chasing after this dude who was just seen assaulting and stabbing this poor woman, leaving her for dead in a parking lot. Uh, he, they are going upwards of over 100 miles per hour on this chase towards Oregon City. Uh, they get on 213 and start heading towards Olala, and then they turn and he goes down into the Canby area, which is off of 99E. He follows, I mean, he, they do this for like a good hour, we'll maybe We'll put a more. map on our uh, website so you guys can see kind of what we're talking about. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's crazy how long this guy was following him. So he follows this dude all the way to his house in Canby. He gets the license plate number and he goes to the nearest pay phone because they didn't have cell phones back in those days and calls the police. The police come out to the property and the truck's not there, but uh, the suspect's wife is there. She says, oh, the truck belongs to my husband, Dayton. And the detective is all like, okay, well, can you tell me where you're where your husband is. This is still in the very wee hours of, of the day, like so early. She says, oh, he, he's working late tonight over at his shop in, in uh, Woodburn. So the detectives find the location of his shop, go there. And there he is inside. And it looks like he's trying to saw something. And one of the detectives just intuitively takes his hand and puts it on the hood of the truck and it's warm. So he goes in there and he asks Dayton, okay, where were you tonight? Did you go anywhere? Oh no, I've been here all night. Detective calls him out and is like, oh, that's strange. The hood of your car is hot. He's like, oh yeah, I went to go get coffee. Hold up, where would you get coffee back then? At, well, I guess Safeway. Like he said Dunkin coffee Dunkin'. at Safeway. Okay, okay. Coffee at Safeway. And the detective looks over and there is a fresh, freshly brewed pot of coffee <laughs> in this man's garage. <laughs> Dayton Leroy Rogers was arrested for the murder of Jennifer Smith, uh, the poor woman in the Denny's parking lot. Uh, she was taken to the hospital, and that's where she was pronounced dead. All life-saving measures at that time were applied, but those wounds were too severe to survive. Um, she had been stabbed over 11 times, and there was slices and cut marks to her breasts. Uh, uh, so, Dayton Leroy Rogers, this was not his first assault. Thank God it was his last. Yes. Yes, it was. He was born into a very strict and conservative family uh, who was also very religious. They were members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, his mother was Jasperella, which super cool name. That's a very interesting name. Right? And his father is Ortis. Not Otis. Ortis. And also interesting name. Yeah. They were very much in love. People said that there was a very appropriate match. I guess, I don't know what that means. Probably really, just well matched. Yeah, just, I guess, it's just a really weird way of putting it. Yeah. Like, oh, you guys are well matched. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I guess Barilla, his mom, loved kids. But Ortis did not like kids. And somehow they ended up having nine or ten, no, eight or nine kids. Most of them girls and two boys. Wait, do we not know how many exactly? Um, some reports say that he was one of nine kids, and others say that he was one of eight. And that's like over a couple different sources, so I was kind of confused, so I'm just going eight or nine. That makes sense. Yeah. Not all of them were biological. Uh, some were adopted, but well, he was cool. the biological son of Jasperella and o Ortis. Adoption is an important thing. Yes. Fun fact. In... The, in 1987, in the summer, when the first or last murder that we're talking about right now happened, it was very interesting weather-wise in Oregon. 
so normally in the summer it doesn't rain but from june all the way through august that i could find it rained every single day yeah that's almost unheard of yeah it was humid Oregon weather weather which is time. also unheard of the weather was totally different than what we have known in our 30 plus year lifetime yeah i can't remember a single day where it's rained on my birthday and i was born in july of 1987 like it just has never rained on my birthday rained days around my birthday never on my actual day well i hate you it rains all the time on my birthday well stop being born in october what <laughs> <laughs> anyway okay so back to dan leroy rogers family his parents kept the kids close. They grew up in poverty and they were constantly moving around. Uh, they were pretty, they kept the kids pretty isolated, very close to the chest. They didn't ever have a chance to form actual relationships with people outside the family unit. And, um, that is very unusual. Yes. Uh, it's, you know, it's really kind of a, a way of psycho psychologically abusing. For children. sure. Because if they're not able to uh, acclimate into society, uh, because all they ever know is your family unit, you can't, you can't expect a well-rounded human being to grow up in that environment. They need social interaction with other people. And while they got that in small amounts, the majority of it was their own family unit. So their father was very, he had a very traditional outlook on um, marital roles. You know, the husband is the breadwinner. The wife is the one that stays at home with the kids. And they were very conservative. So everybody dressed conservatively to give you an idea of how conservative. In fact, he loved Hawaiian music, his father, but the records would come with images of Hawaiian dancers with their coconut bras and their grass skirts. And he would actually take paint or a marker and draw clothes on them, only exposing like their neck and head, their hands and their feet. He would often refer to women as whores and sluts. Uh, and he was very physically abusive, randomly abusive, would use belts uh, and his fist often leaving them bloody and bruised and uh, people inside the family witnessed this and could attest to Ortis being very abusive. This dude needs some help. Uh, yeah, and that's just his father. Um, his mother, while she loved children, she never stepped in to defend her children from her husband. And Dayton grew up hating her because he never felt like she defended him and therefore didn't love him. Dayton claimed on many occasions during his during adulthood uh, that he was sexually assaulted by his sisters as a young man or a young child uh, and he would refer to them often as sluts and whores um, but That's awful. also during adolescence he would get aroused by his sister's feet and their shoes would go missing often usually because he had them and he was jacking off with them um, he and I think this goes back to like how conservative and how close knit the family was, because when you have such a, a close knit group, you're going to look within that group when you're starting to develop those types of feelings as, you know, a 10 year old, 11 year old, somebody going through puberty. It gets really confusing when all you have to do is, or all you have is to look at, um, you know, your sister or your adoptive sister, family members, and the most sexual item is their feet. It makes sense because they don't really see any humans other than their family. And also the fact that their clothing was so conservative and it covered everything except the feet, that kind of makes sense in a psychological way. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Hands down. By far. Uh, completely agree with you. Since they moved around a lot, Ortis had this 
sinking feeling like there was, he would repeatedly tell his children that there was something evil inside of them. And he used religion as a way to get the children to acknowledge and admit that there was something evil inside of them. So that's a type of psychological warfare, I'm sure. And eventually, Dayton in middle school, him and a friend, which he actually made a friend, living in a small town outside of Walla Walla in Washington, they were arrested for shooting BB guns at passing cars. He was given a sentence of probation, and then they also moved out of the area. One of the punishments that his parents did uh, regarding that is send him off to a Seventh day Adventist Academy. Are you in serious? Oregon. Yes. Okay, so this was pre us being friends, maybe yeah. at the very beginning of us being friends. So one day I was leaving where D and I met, where we used to work. I was leaving Fry's in Wilsonville, driving all the way up to the Hillsboro area, which is like a half hour drive at night. And these two cars, one in front of me and one in back of me, they were shooting BB guns at each other, but it looked like real weapons. There was yeah. no indication that anything, nothing was glowing. You know, it looked fully painted black. Freaked me out. They ended up on probation. That... Being someone who has been in a police car arresting people and it terrified me says a lot. Yeah. It's no joke. <laughs> Don't do it, folks. That was his only conviction as a minor so he eventually ran away that's cool okay i'm done now okay this was the only uh offense he was convicted of or caught for as a minor uh eventually he ran away and he started his own painting business and got married i think at 18 or 19 to a 16 year old girl and um, one day, when he, in 1972, he picked up a hitchhiker, a teenager, and uh, they, he took her to a field where they got intoxicated and they had sex. But then he took her home. He came by the next day, picked her up, went back to that same field where they again had sex. And as they're like hanging out in the field, uh, all of a sudden, this poor girl feels something plunge into her body. Oh, jeez. And she looks down, and there's a knife. He had just randomly Stop. stabbed her. Holy moly. Yep. And in that moment, she knew two things were going to happen. She was either going to die, or she was going to do everything in her power to convince him to take her to the hospital. She asks him, Dayton, why did you do this? And his response, I did it because you don't love me. And she said, Dayton, why do you think I don't love you? I love you. He said, because you have a boyfriend. Somehow she took that and twisted it and convinced him to drop her off at the ER. And he did. He picked her up, put her in the car, dropped her off at the ER, and took took off. Wow, could you imagine being her? And, like, you just got stabbed, but you have the ability to convince this crazy dude who just stabbed you to take you to the hospital. Like, that takes a lot of effort. Yeah. And she was, she was scared. Uh, the first time people, or the a detective came around and asked her what happened, uh, she lied, of course, because she didn't, she did not want to be, um, involved with Dayton again, of course. And eventually, like, the story didn't make sense. So, they came back, and they asked her again, and that's when she revealed, this is what happened. He stabbed me. He told me that he loved me. And they went to arrest him. And he was convicted and sentenced to a mental institution. And I believe four years probation. So at this mental institution... Damish? No, I don't think it was Damish. Hmm. I'd have to... I'd have to re I think... No, I think it was the one in Salem. Oh, okay. Oregon State Hospital. Got it. That's right. Oregon Ho State Hospital in Salem, Oregon is where he was um, admitted to. 
And the medical professionals, the mental health medical professionals there, after evaluating him, could tell, like, if he were to ever get out, it is just a, a matter of time before he murders somebody. But somehow, he kept getting downgraded in levels of security until he was released for, like, good behavior. Then he was on probation for four years. That's great. Yep. During that time, though, his wife divorced him, which kudos to you because I would have probably done the same thing. Uh, if you're going around having sex with random chicks and I'm at home. And then stabbing and them. And then you're also stabbing them. Mm, peace, buddy. Yeah. So the fact that she had the balls to divorce him, like to get out, like great job. You are amazing. That's what yeah. everyone should do. But that is not easy. It is not easy. It is not. No, absolutely not. You always want to think the best of your, your spouse. But, I mean, it's hard to think the best of your spouse when he both, you know, sexed up a teenager and stabbed her and now is in a mental institution. And back there, m mental institutions were, like, really, really, like, a no-no. Like, oh, that's not okay. You're crazy. Pat, pat. Yeah. So it was really looked down upon, from my understanding of the times. Um, after he was released from the mental institution, while he was still on parole, uh, in 1976, he assaulted two teenage girls who were skipping school. He picks them up, just like he did the hitchhiker, didn't know him beforehand, loads them up with alcohol and marijuana, and um, totally, like, sets the scene to make it so they're also copperable for what's about to happen. They go and they find, he finds a field or an area that's off the beaten path. And he gets stuck in the mud. And they're laughing about it at first. And drinking, smoking pot, general conversation. And then eventually something turns in him. And it's like a flip go, a switch goes off. And he pulls a knife out of the glove compartment of his car and holds him at knife point. Hog ties him. Has sex with one of them in front of the other. And eventually realizes, holy crap, I need their help to get unstuck. So he unties them and they escape. I mean, wow. I wouldn't have helped him get unstuck. Uh, no. So, I if mean. you do, I'm out. Bye. Please don't chase me. Yeah, don't don't chase me. Uh, I'm. We're just gonna run and we're gonna keep running. He was uh, cleared of rape, but co convict uh, convicted of coercion and sent to prison this time. Uh, and then he, that was also followed up with probation. During the eighties, he was arrested for four more assaults to women. Uh, one being somebody that he knew at a bar starts again here let's go hang out loads the women up with pot with alcohol he's drinking too he's smoking too they go out to a random field and he assaults them he definitely has an mo yeah he hog ties them assaults them one woman got out away because she had to pee so she got out of the car she went to go pee and she took off and he didn't chase her. Another woman told him after the assault, the hog tying, the rape, told him, here's my grandma's address. Drop me off there. She's not home. I can get in. I will not tell anyone ever. And she convinces him basically to do that. And she makes it to her. Her grandma's house. And that's when she calls the police. He is very gullible. Or these girls are amazing at convincing them. Or maybe both. I'm going to say that they're amazing at convincing him. Kudos to them. Seriously. Yeah. And then he then again takes another two females. Hog ties them. Rapes them. They escape because they have to pee. And they just take off running into the forest. He was only convicted of one of those rapes. Wow. Yeah. Um, and at the end of that probation, uh, there's an exit interview at the end of probation. And 
the probation officer asks him, Dayton, is there anything you would have done differently? No. Looks him dead in the face and says, next time I won't leave witnesses. And there was nothing the probation officer could have said or done to do anything about that. Could you imagine being that person? Dumbfounded. I would have been terrified. Terrified. Dumbfounded and terrified. I mean, I'll, I, I don't even know. I don't even know. That would be probably a life changing event. Definitely. I've never wanted to stalk anyone before, but if I was put in that position, I might stalk the person to help their victims. But knowing how dangerous he is, I might still do it. I mean, that's your prerogative. I don't think I could. I think I'd move to another state. I'd be like, here's somebody you need to watch out for. Bye, Felicia. I don't think I could have lived with myself if I hadn't done something like follow the dude and try to help. I don't think I could follow him. I don't think I'm a stalker. Hopefully we'll never have to find out. Yeah. It's good to know that you're you're a stalker. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, okay, good to know not to piss Tiffany off. Yep, I will stalk. He is now in custody uh, for the murder of Jenny Smith in August of 1987. On September 7th, 1987, Three weeks after his arrest, a hunter trying to scope out a good spot. It's the beginning of hunting season. He is looking for a place that will secure him a deer. And he drives out to a place that he knows well. And it's the Malala Forest Road. He goes out on this road, goes to a spot he's been before, and he starts scoping out a good location. All of a sudden, he gets hit in the face with the powerful smell of decay. And I don't know if you've ever smelled decay before. Um, We used to have, growing up, we used to have like mice or rodents in the the basement. And my grandparents would use poison. We would go down there and we would smell the dead decaying mice. And we would tell my grandparents. Uh, It is, it is a horrible smell. It is. It is absolutely horrible and i was smelling it on a small scale like this is just a dead small animal and it's still so like it permeates it's horrible so he smells this and he's like oh there must be a dead animal around here and he starts kind of following the smell and eventually he sees this fern and this fern is kind of brown and looks like it's dying and he kind of like moves the book like the the leaves aside and he sees that there's a dead body there and so he immediately goes to the nearest payphone and calls the police and leads the police up there the detectives get on scene they start the investigation and they start you know searching the immediate area and they find a second body and at that point they knew they had a situation and they started setting up a grid search so they marked it out like an archaeological um, dig site they had certain squares they had it all marked off uh, and they went shoulder to shoulder in a straight line doing a search and they picked up everything that was not naturally made by the forest and that's when they started to find bodies three and four and five and a couple of the detectives were taken back by the smell. Oh. Like, the smell was so bad of decay. It was horrendous that they decided, okay, we need to get some fresh air and smoke a cigarette. It's the 80s, people. I guess fresh air equals cigarette. Either way, probably better than the smell of decaying women. Definitely. Walk down the hill a little bit. They find a spot and they start smoking. And all of a sudden... One of the detectives picks up that smell again. Great. And they find body six and seven. Just what they wanted on their break. Yep, just what they wanted on their break. These bodies, these remains, were all partially mummified, which is weird because it's Oregon, it's wet, it's rainy. As Tiffany said, the weather was weirdly moist 
that year, that summer. And it's at the state of decay. It was really hard to make out all the wounds. The detectives searched the crime scene for nine days. Thoroughly searched the crime scene for nine days. And after nine days of collecting evidence and nine days of removing the remains of seven women, one of the detectives realized that a lot of these same items that they found were identical to another crime scene. A crime scene that he had been a part of the investigation on. And that was the murder scene of Jenny Smith. And the suspect they had in, in custody was Dayton and Roy Rogers. What are the chances? Dude is fucked. Dude is fucked. So here's the thing. Okay. It's the 80s. Yeah, it is. DNA is not what it was. No, it is not. Identifying these bodies and what happened to them is is going to be lengthy. And our weather situation that year is not going to help them any. No. Which is unfortunate. So here's where we're going to leave you with a cliffhanger. Who were these women? What did they do? How did they die? And how... Do they find the killer? Is it Dayton Leroy Rogers? Or is it someone else? It could be Jerry Brugis. It was the same time frame. It was very similar MO. Yep. They same area. The Washington Green Green River Killer Task Force very actually true. got involved and were there and was like, is this our guy? Is this not our guy? So join us next week when we reveal the identities of the seven women found in the forest of Malala. The forest. The Join <laughs> us next week <laughs> when we tell you the identities of these women who were found by these detectives. Maybe it is Dayton. Who knows? It could be part of the Green River Task Force. Or Jerry Brutus. Yep, there's apparently a lot of options, which is Terrifying. You don't know yet, and you want to, so join us next week. I don't either. She doesn't. She doesn't know. I only know. I mean, the internet knows, but don't go there. You want to come here. You want to come here, and you want me to tell you this tale that I'm badly telling you. So... Thank you for stopping by, listening to our first episode. And make sure to tune in next week when we continue the tale. Bye!